Astronomy, astrophysics and cosmology have evolved dramatically over the last 50 years. At the beginning of that period, astronomy really meant optical astronomy with optical telescopes. But in the 1960s and 1970s, suddenly the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum was opened up for astronomical observations, both from ground and from in space. So that meant that we could now study the cosmos in the radio, to the millimetre, infrared, optical, ultraviolet, X-ray, gamma ray, gravitational waves. And these gave us completely new views of the universe and new ways of studying some of the big problems we tried to solve in astrophysics and cosmology. If you were to ask me what was the best year in which you should start studying modern astrophysics and cosmology, it would be 1963, exactly the date when I started doing research as a graduate student. And I was put on by my uh, supervisor, Martin Ryle and Peter Scheuer, onto the, the energetic phenomena at that time, the radio galaxies. And I was lucky that I did some good research early in my career as a first and second year graduate student. And then I wanted to work with the best astrophysicists and had been very impressed by the work which had been done in the Soviet Union by people like Ginsberg and Zeldovich, whom I'd met G Ginsberg in Cambridge at the time. I said I'd like to go to the Soviet Union to work with these people and their students because they were doing completely different things from what was happening in the West. And it was that way in which I met uh, Zeldovich and my, my colleague uh, Rashid Sutnyayev. And we had a fantastic year studying all of these things. They did not know about the things that we were doing observationally in Cambridge, uh, and I didn't know the types of science they were doing. So we worked together to learn each other's specialities. Now, uh, Zeldovich and his group, again, had pioneered much of the physics of the early universe and the Big Bang, uh, almost in parallel with the work of Jim Peebles in Princeton. So the, I think most of us agree that it was the Moscow group and, the, and Princeton group, which was really largely Jim Peebles on his own, who opened up the whole of the, what I would call the astrophysics of the Big Bang uh, model of the universe. And so I was there uh, right in, the, in between uh, all of these people, uh, uh, learning my cosmology and making various contributions to it. My vision is that everything is driven by technology and the technologies determine how well you can observe the sky in the diff diff different wave bands. Every time there is a new wave band made available, you make great discoveries. There's no, no question about that. But if I had to highlight some of the things which I think are absolutely fabulous, uh, I would have to say that things like the Planck experiment of the European Space Agency, analysing the microwave background radiation is absolutely remarkable. The other one which totally blows my mind is the discovery of the gravitational waves. I never expected I would live to see gravitational waves detected. But that was a project which had started in the 1970s, 1980s, and it was only in 2016, by perseverance, that in fact they got to the sensitivities where when the first gravitational wave burst appeared, there was no question they had got it. What is happening in these gravitational waves is that we are studying strong gravity. So that normally uh, we use weak gravity what holds us to the, to the surface of the Earth, what makes the planets go about, about the Sun. But in the case of gravitational wave astronomy, we are looking at the very strong gravitational fields where the energies are close to the, to the E equals mc squared result, this famous Einstein-Einstein equation. And that means that we can now study gravitational phenomena in the strong field limit. And that's where we may find surprises about the way that gravity actually works in, on, in, under these extreme conditions. The great discovery was the coalescence of two black holes orbiting each other, coalescing into a single black hole. 
when the two black holes are just about to coalesce, they are moving about each other at half the speed of light. So you've got to imagine something, two very massive objects, orbiting each other at the speed of light. That's incredible. And yet that is what happens when these gravitational wave bursts occurred. The discovery of the gamma ray bursts was uh, one of the other dramatic discoveries in, in astronomy. They were discovered by accident. The telescopes which were built were built in order to detect infringements of the nuclear test ban treaties. But they discovered huge bursts of gamma rays which were not from atmospheric tests but were genuine astronomical phenomena. Now, they were of such extreme intensities that we know that they must be relativistically beamed. That is to say that the beams of particles which are being emitted by various types of high energy systems must be travelling very close to the speed of light so that we can get the huge luminosities that we, we observe in the gamma ray bursts. Very distant objects like galaxies and quasars, they took a long time to get up to the early universe. Whereas the gamma ray bursts, they're as, almost as soon as they were discovered, we, dis we discovered them at very large distances and so in the early universe. So they're another tool for studying the early universe. I've got a very profound belief that when you are looking to do new and innovative science, you must look at the interfaces between disciplines. If you're interested in understanding the origins of life on planets, you must work at the interface between physics, chemistry, biology, molecular biology, and then do all of this on models of the surfaces of planets. Now that's a beautiful example where the advances will only come through all of these fields coming together to actually work out the physical conditions under which things can happen. And the same will happen in the problems of, of cosmology. The particle physicists and the astronomers, the astrophysicists, they, they will come together to actually try to find the ways in which you can find things which will model the, the, the dark energy and the dark matter. Well, yes, it is, it is really an annoying that we believe that about 95% of the mass in the universe are in forms that we do not really know what they are. And these are the dark matter and the dark energy. The dark matter, I believe, personally, will be solved within the next 20 years or so. But at the moment, we do not know what it is. It is definitely there in galaxies. And it is real matter. It gravitates just like ordinary matter to form the structures that we, we see. And the way that the models work uh, really are very compelling that that component of the universe is there. It is not just imagination. The observational evidence is very, very strong. I call it slightly annoying because we ought to be able to have detected something. So many things have been ruled out. And almost the only things which are left are new types of particles, which is why the particle physicists are now so excited by these astronomical developments. It may be some new particle indicating the need for new physics. And that is, again, what many people are, are working on. My own view is that that is, that is probably a, an understandable problem. But the dark energy is harder because it is it came as a big surprise in the early in the 1990s and the early 2000s where it became really compelling that there is this what we'd either call the cosmological constant which is interpreted as a field present in the structure of physics but we don't know what that is and it's got strange properties now my perspective is that there are opportunities to do study similar types of matter in the laboratory nowadays. So the very distinctive thing about the dark energy is that it has got what we call a negative pressure equation of state. So that most gases push outwards. The dark energy has got to pull inwards. So it's rather than being a pressure, it's a tension that you're dealing with. Now there are very few fields like that in physics. Uh, the Higgs bosons have got that type of property, but you cannot deal with them in bulk. 
But nowadays in the laboratory, you can create systems which have almost got that same property of a negative pressure equation of state. If you go to extremely low temperatures and use things called Bose-Einstein condensations, then some of my colleagues are able to simulate that type of field. And so I'm hoping that we will get insights from these types of laboratory experiments into what will be happening in the cosmos in general in the very early universe. Now, the reason I started uh, writing books um, in, my, in my 30s and 40s was that I had actually not been taught physics very well. And so I had to relearn everything myself. And that proved to be very beneficial because I was always asking myself, why am I doing this? Why am I writing these formulae down this way? And trying to find out where they came from. And that is not normally done in the textbooks. So this was a personal way of doing it, but emphasizing why the physics had to work out that way. And I've done that over astrophysics, cosmology, and in my books and theoretical concepts in physics and quantum concepts in physics, that's always trying to dig out the essential things which drives the science. And that's what I will be doing in my lectures here at the, at the winter school. It opens their eyes and gives them a new way of looking at it. But in the end, I tell the students, you've got to understand physics your own way. Here is my way of understanding it. If it's helpful, that's great. But maybe you think in a different way. And go and do it yourself. Learn the stuff the way you will understand the things, and then you will get the imaginative insights which will help you be a better scientist.